my mind. Looks like we're in the clear, clear, clear. What is going on you guys and welcome back to another episode of our portfolio update series for you guys. If you're new to the channel here, my name is Brandon. I'm joined in person with my father Mark. Hey Brad, good to see you. How you doing? <laughs> good. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's good to be here in person. For those of you who don't know us, I don't live in Vancouver where, where uh, Brandon lives. And I'm in town for a very special occasion. Yeah. And while I'm here, we thought we'd get together and film a video. But uh, yeah, as of uh, well, as of yesterday, Brandon is a married man. Got the ring there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Brandon and Vivian, after years and years and years of being together, uh, got married. They tied, tied the knot the yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So that is awesome. So of course we had to be here for that. Um, and then hey, a little bit of and film a video here too. Well, you know, yeah. while we're here, well, well. while you're here, why not, well, right? Why not? Yeah. Well, so, no. So con publicly, congratulations, Brandon. That Thanks, was awesome. Yeah, Thanks for good. making the trip down. You I appreciate betcha, that. You betcha, of course. Well, hey, we got to dive into this update because we have an exciting one for you guys. We actually made some big sells, which is I guess a little less common for what you know the position we're in with our portfolios. We're buying, 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 but we did make a couple notable sells. And for a very good reason, which we're going to talk about later, it has been a while since we've done an update. So we do owe you guys a nice deep one. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, why don't we start off with our Q&A segment, which we do every single time. I will just ask you guys, if you enjoy the series, take a moment and give this a big thumbs up. As always, of course, if you do want courses and training, we do have our Investing Academy down below. That's that first link in the description to check out. But let's dive on into the Q&A. And we're going to start off with a question here from a guy named Bruce. And he says, I never know when to sell at a loss. I always think it'll go back up and then I'm left hanging on to losers that either go down or stagnant for several months. And uh, yeah, basically I guess a question on never know when to sell. And again, we, we did make a couple sells here. So this may be something that you piece into your strategy if it makes sense. But yeah, buying stocks that never go back up and they just hang on to losers. Yeah, it's always easier to buy a stock than it is to sell it. There's no question about that. For sure. But there are some very good reasons that you might want to sell. We'll talk about one of them today and uh, maybe we'll expand on it a little bit. But just also, a number of months ago, we did a video uh, specifically on, it was... When to sell a stock. How to probably sell a stock. Yeah. Right? A few, would... reasons, few reasons as to why you would sell a stock. Yeah. And I'll, I'll link that up for you guys because it basically goes over what we believe about three or four key reasons why, you know, you purchase a stock, you assess it at this given point, it may no longer be the right stock for you. Mm -hmm. And there could be a variety of, of reasons why that's the case. But um, it, 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 it does happen, you know, from time to time. And even, you know, a lot of people like us say you'd like to buy a stock and in a perfect world that would just go up, 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 up. Um, but that's not always the case. No. Now, if it does, so just to answer the question yeah. or throw a couple of ideas in. First of all, if you buy a stock, oh, in this case, yeah, you can. You might want to sell a stock because it's gone up and it's overweighted and it's too... But here you know, he's talking about when to sell at a loss. Yeah, so first of all, hopefully um, the proper due diligence went in, the proper strategizing went in before you bought it. So it wasn't just a, well, I read this... And somewhere and not to cut you off, but mm. I feel like that's what happens far too often with these types of comments. You know, they buy a stock thinking it'll go back up and they're hanging on to losers because they bought a bad quality business to begin with. You know what I mean? They bought a stock that maybe shouldn't have been a, a stock for their portfolio. Well, and hopefully it doesn't happen too often, Bruce, but you did say here, um, I, I always, always think so. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and don't, I mean, don't feel horrible because this is not that atypical that that happens, but um, I would say if you buy a company and you did your homework, it goes down, uh, use that first of all as a learning opportunity. And if it happens over and over, I mean, look at the common threads and say, why am I buying companies? My guess is you're probably buying them because um, they're the hot stock of the day. That's m the most common reason. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're going down. Then once it goes down, uh, to me, one of the, uh, one of the, the, the most difficult or one of the worst decisions an investor can make is you hear that. And I heard this all the time when I was working in the industry is I'm just going to wait till it comes back up to what I bought it. So there's just, it's a, it's a superficial number. It's, it doesn't matter if you bought it at $10 and it went down to five because that's backward looking. You're always looking forward. Mm -hmm. And so assess, does this company that I own shares of have the, the potential, a realistic potential of regaining those losses? If so, and you mentioned a few months. A few months is really nothing in the big scheme of things if yeah. you're a, a longer term investor. So I wouldn't be too worried about that, but assess the company. And I always like to think, would you buy it again today? Has mm -hmm. something Great fundamentally point. changed? 
with the company that would you know make you not enter the position today that might be a, a uh, an opportunity a reason to yeah. sell it also i'm just going to mention it depends on whether it's in your rsp depends on whether it's in your tax-free savings account or a non-registered account where um, you can do what's called tax loss harvesting, which we're going to talk about in this video. Mm -hmm. um, anything else, Brandon, that you want to add to that? or No, I think we know that. Again, I think what we'll do is actually post that video up for Bruce, mm -hmm. and we won't take any longer on this question sure. because, um, yeah, we kind of made a video covering that pretty much. But Common question. Common question. Yeah. It yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to another question from Berna. He says, Brandon and Mark, I recently bought into Facebook as well, but it was a fractional share. I could be wrong, but when you buy fractional shares, you aren't actually an o a share owner of the company. All fractional shares are fulfilled at the end of the trading day because they need to pool money to buy in order to buy full shares. Do you know if you become a real share owner once you've reached a full share in Wealthsimple? Hoping to hear from you soon. And that's actually a good question. I think that's more a question for me because I'm more, I guess, in tune with the Wealthsimple app. Well, yeah. We're using it basically every single day. Um, certainly when you do buy fractional shares, you are still getting the rights to dividends. I honestly have to double check whether you get things like voting rights and whether it's treated like uh, an actual shareholder. You know, for me personally, ever since I started investing, the ability to, you know, vote on company matters and actually partake in that side of the business mm -hmm. uh, as a stock owner, that's never, never appealed to me. I've never cared for it. And it's something that I honestly should know. But when it comes to fractional shares, it is still a relatively new uh phenomenon here in the Canadian market. Mm -hmm. So it is something that I will have to touch up on just to double check. Uh, I don't think it would matter whether you have like half a shares worth of shares and then you topple over to like a full share. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you have enough fractional shares to make a full share, I think the answer would either be yes, you do get, you partake in, uh, you know, shareholder rights, shareholder rights, whether yeah. you have a fraction of a share or a full share or you don't. So that's something that I can double check on and uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll leave a comment down below, maybe posted below this video when I do get the answer to that question. But it is a great question and unfortunately I just don't quite know the answer to that at this given moment. Question here from uh, Doug Adama. Another great episode guys, just a minor comment about doubling up in TD. So we own TD in both our Quest Trade and Wealth Simple. He said, if you're building a dividend portfolio with drips in mind, then wouldn't it make more sense to hold a good <laughs> dividend stock under a single account, I guess, rather than splitting them up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This would allow you to take advantage of the drip option in the future sooner as your stocks aren't split across both platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he goes on to say, I do recall that you mentioned one of the past episodes, you weren't a fan of drips either. So great point, right? Because uh, when good you, question, yeah. Yeah, because when you do need to, uh, for, especially when the share prices of stocks get higher, mm, okay. um, you do need to have a, a sizable amount in order to fulfill a drip, in order right. to buy a, a, an additional share. So he's saying, why would you split that up and kind of hold yourselves back from that? Mm -hmm. um, I guess if the drip option is on the table for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, as you mentioned here, Doug, we... Neither of us are, are big fans of drips. I, I wouldn't say fan of drip. It's just not for us. Well, sorry. Good good yeah. clarification. For our style, for yeah. our strategies, we don't use it. Great clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, for for If it is something that you partake in, I think your comment makes a lot of or Your question makes a lot of sense. It that does. You would consolidate them to be more eligible. We prefer to manage the dividend cash flow that comes into the portfolio so that we can allocate to whatever company we want, not necessarily the company that paid the dividend. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's lots of different scenarios where you where it would be appropriate, I would say, to use drips. And your I think your question is a very good one. It is. If that's something you want to do, then yeah, I think uh, you know all else being equal, is a good, not a bad option. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that just comes down to our personal take on it. Another another just a touch a nuance on that as well because what we're doing here is we're building two separate portfolios one growth and one balanced mm -hmm. and in our opinion um, certainly a company like TD is appropriate for the balanced portfolio no question about it you might say well gee that's not really is it a growth company should it be in the growth portfolio uh, we're not going to build that growth portfolio of only the high flying companies mm -hmm. so you do want to have some depth to that portfolio so when we look at these from the two portfolio perspectives I think it does make sense to own both of those um, so that's another reason why we split them and we'll see another example of that Coming up, we yeah, well, one of the well. stocks we added. So, exactly. Yeah, thanks for that question. That's awesome. Great question. Mm. Michael Gang, Gagne? Gagne. Gagne. I'm still new here, so I have a question. I have a Lira account and I have a TFSA. Which is the best for dividend investments? Um, I would say 
for starters, dividend investments we feel are good for almost every, uh, almost any account. Mm -hmm. The only nuance I would think what might make a difference here is uh, in the lira. Any if if you do own U.S. companies in your uh, in that account, the dividends will not have, be subject to that fifteen percent withholding tax that yeah, we're all kind of aware of. That's the only thing I think about. Um, in the tax-free savings account, yeah, um, they would be. So there would be a, a difference there. I think it would also depend on what your goals are for each of those mm -hmm. um, each of those accounts. Strictly from a dividend perspective. I, the only difference I would think you want to be aware of the withholding tax is the withholding tax. Yeah, a lira, a lira would classify as a retirement account, mm -hmm. similar to the RRSP. Mm -hmm. And what there's this there's a treaty in in place that says when we have retirement accounts here in Canada, whether it's a locked in account, whether it's your RRSP, whatever yeah. that is, you don't have to pay that withholding tax. Mm -hmm. The TFSA, mm -hmm. bit of a different vehicle. You you do. So yeah, good question. Very commonly, um, there's a lot of confusion over that. So thanks for yeah. giving us the opportunity to speak on that. Um, should we finish off with these two questions or sure. one more? What do you think? Let's, let's, uh, let's two, do a couple, yeah. Two more questions, just so we're not running too far on time yeah. here, guys. But uh, JF Runner says, if you even if you have 20% of your portfolio in cash and you are lucky enough to buy the dip and then the market sees a 10% rise, you only make a 2% of total gain. Not much for, not much for so... Much Not cash for so side. much cash aside. Yeah. Um, yeah, common question, especially with all the volatility we've seen in the markets lately. There's more than one reason I would suggest that you would hold some cash. Um, first of all, um, JF Runner here, one of the things that this calculation discounts is the fact that when the markets do correct, Obviously, the money you have in cash won't correct. So that will help you. Yeah. That so, yeah. So it's not just what you gain on the upside; it's what you don't lose on the downside. And mm -hmm. I know there's all kinds of contrary. You only lose when you sell, etc. But I think you get the the understanding here. If you're even playing somewhat of an active role in managing the portfolio, the the, the drop down will allow you to you know buy the dip or take advantage. Um, also, I would say if you just buy like a, a broad index, like the S&P 500 or the TSX, um, maybe less of an issue there. Yeah. When you when you are actively managing a portfolio and you have, for example, a watch list, or maybe there's companies that you want to add to the portfolio, you just don't see the price being right yet. The the dips or the drops that we're talking about here um, will happen. Then if you don't have any cash on the side, you you don't have the option of adding to the portfolio or broadening it out or making those changes. So mm -hmm. um, having that cash on the side... It plays um, multiple roles in the portfolio. plays I multiple think. roles. And uh, another one, just quickly before we move on, is just from a volatility perspective. You know, when the markets are, are rich, a lot of people um, just don't have the tolerance to, to withstand the ups and the downs. So that cash does play a, a balanced role in the portfolio as well. So a few reasons, good logic here, I think... Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully added a little bit to the to the question. Mm -hmm. Last question in from Kuhn. Good to hear from Kuhn. Yeah. For the high beta stocks that do not swing together, I would switch my winners from my TFSA to my regular account and switch my losers to my TFSA account to collect taxable capital losses. The one way to take this is one this one way to take advantage of choppiness in the market. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good strategy, and um, I don't think uh, Kuhn. Thank you for answering for asking this. I don't think it's really a question; it was more of a comment. Um, the only thing I yeah. thought we what, like, I might, do this. we might want to speak about this is just when uh, you use the term switch, and just to make sure the viewers understand uh, that can mean different things. If you simply transfer, so imagine the scenario here: you've got a non-registered account, you've taken regular a loss, or you've got it. the losers in there, a regular account, and you want to switch those into your TFSA. It makes sense, but if you do a transfer, you will not get the benefit of that capital loss. Mm -hmm. So that's something to really be aware of. You have to sell the investment and then transfer the cash into your TFSA to crystallize that loss. That's really important. Also you then have that superficial loss rule kicks in. So you can't simply sell it, get the loss, and move it into your TF TFSA and buy it back. You will lose the benefit of that. Yeah. Uh, so that was more of a comment we wanted to add to, to round out this discussion, but to take advantage of the choppiness, I mean, a great strategy. Just be really careful that you do it uh, in the proper way. Otherwise, you'll lose the whole benefit of that. It's fair. And, mm. you know, it's uh, although from a conceptual level, I, I do agree. Like, yeah, there's there are benefits to that. Mm. From a practicality standpoint, I don't know if that's something I would do on a consistent basis. That's just a personal opinion there. Mm -hmm. When you factor in the space that you have in such such accounts, uh, I mean, for a lot of people, they may have their TFSA 
flat out maxed out. So it kind of isn't an option to be popping more money in and, and whatnot. But um, nevertheless, it is something that I think is, is it's a fair thought nonetheless. It's, it's a good thought. Yeah, good point. If your circumstances, mm-hmm. you know, accommodate this, mm-hmm. then uh, something, to, uh, something to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the activity of the portfolio. I forgot to mention off the top. So our total account value as of drawing these numbers, it's now sitting at 55.9. Okay. Not too shabby. Just re- recapping, we started this from a portfolio of 40,000 uh, yeah. a number of months back. Now we've been adding on a monthly basis. So and, a, and, yeah. a, a large chunk of this growth is the $1,000 contributions that we're doing on top of the growth from s- some of the stocks in the portfolios. But um, in terms of the activity, we made four buys during the period and three sells. So pretty even actually. And yeah. not a crazy amount of buys. And unusual because... We started with only cash, so obviously, and, and we're about seven months in now, so so the, the bulk of the activity is going to be adding positions to the portfolio. But we did, uh, in this case, we yeah we bought four, we made four buys, which is actually only three companies, Yep. and then um, we did make three sales. So why don't you start off, Brandon, by yeah. talking about the sales we made in the Quest Trade account, and keep in mind, these are non-registered accounts, so they're not... It's a margin account. They're, these right. are both margin accounts, yeah. Correct. So the stocks that we sold were Alibaba and Tencent. And I made a comment on one of my last videos and I got a lot of people like, they're waiting for this video because they want to know. But hopefully through the Q&A segment, we've kind of primed it for you guys. We sold these two stocks for the very simple reason as this time of the year tends to happen more and more. Um, The term that you're going to come across is tax loss harvesting or uh, tax loss selling. Interchangeable what you want. But... Just to be very clear on these stock, we we didn't um, decide that uh, these shares are down probably about twenty five to thirty percent a piece in both portfolios, give or take uh, each of them. Sort of in the Quest Trade portfolio. In the Quest Trade portfolio, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah, both of these stocks are held in the Quest Trade portfolio. If yeah. I, if I wasn't clear, we don't own these stocks in the Wealth Symbol portfolio. Yeah. These stocks are still companies that we want to own for the long term. In our opinion. We haven't given these stocks the time necessary to play out as to whether or not uh, we made a good decision or a bad decision. Like you said, it's been half a year and over the short term like that, things can happen. Mm -hmm. Our thesis on this company and particularly mine is far more bullish than a lot of people would, would believe. Again, there's the risks that come with that. There sure are. But for the growth portfolio, which is more of our risk taking portfolio, we feel these stocks are still very suitable. That said, because we have experienced a significant loss in both of these positions, by selling these stocks, as we kind of primed there with Kuhn's question, yeah. what you can do is actually crystallize these losses. And in the taxable account, for any gains that we make, uh, in terms of let's assume one of our other stocks, like a Google or Apple has done well, if we sell that stock for a gain, well, because it's a non-registered account, because we're trading in a margin account, those capital gains, the income that we make or the the... Growth. The, the growth that we yeah. make, I should say, as a more technical term, yeah. that is subject to tax. With these tax loss sells that we do, we can actually offset some of those gains. And it's not that we actually sold any stocks for a gain during this period or at all, but it's something that we can actually use going forward. So it was more or less a, a, a crystallizing. It's like kind of like putting some ammo in our in the yeah. pocket for when that time comes, you know what I'm saying? And and you can carry for you can carry those losses forward indefinitely. Right. So the fact that you uh, you you crystallize a loss in 2021, you don't it doesn't have mean to that, yeah. trigger a gain. So there's a couple of different reasons you might want to take a gain. Uh, first of all, you might want to trim back on a position, like you say, Google. Yep. Or so far in the portfolio, it's done quite well. Well, it may get to a point where we say, just for balance purposes, we want to take some of that money off the table. Normally, like you say, that would be a taxable event. Mm-hmm. Not the end of the world. You make money, you pay taxes. That's okay. But if you can, if you can um, balance that out with uh, by offsetting, offsetting it yeah. with a loss, mm-hmm. then uh, from just purely from a tax perspective, um, that could be beneficial. Now, I know because and when you look at Baba and you look at uh, Tencent, they're very volatile stocks. So a danger of doing this mm-hmm. strategy is okay. So you take that hit. And now what happens if the, your timing is really bad and they take off over the next um, shoot up 20% days? Over, yeah, kind of because we didn't, because just to clarify, there is a superficial loss period, which you touched on. Mm. We can't buy these stocks back. Um, probably looking to, well, there's not going to be an immediate rush to get them back on day 31. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, you do have a period where you can't buy these 
particular stocks, these exact companies, Correct. Baba and Tencent. Mm -hmm. But uh, to carry on with what what we did in order to kind of uh, mitigate against this mm -hmm. is <laughs> we, <laughs> we we bought our first ETF in the portfolio, or mm -hmm. sorry, our first equity ETF. We yes. do have some fixed income ETFs, but we bought our first equity ETF. So there's an ETF called MCHI, and it's the iShares China ETF. And I don't remember off the top of my head, but a large Very heavy chunk weighting. of it, like a quarter of the fund roughly is Tencent and Alibaba. Possibly Somewhere, even more, yeah. Possibly even more. Yeah. So the idea is um, we don't want to miss out on a possible bump up. And we've seen... The past know, two days, they've, yeah, a bit of a bounce. Yeah, quite a bounce. And so rather than just being out of the market, we bought the MCHI. And even though it does have a heavy weighting in those companies, it's a different investment. It is. So it, it doesn't mitigate or doesn't eliminate the tax, the, uh, tax loss benefits. Mm -hmm. So... Then the idea would be once uh, you know they've once with the 31 days have gone by, we will look at or the, you know in the 31st day on, yeah. we will look at um, possibly switching them back mm -hmm. and getting a benefit out of that, carrying those losses forward for future gains. With the intention of uh, of doing so, again, mm -hmm. it's more or less at that time we can make an assessment, and yeah. it's um, you know. 30 days from now, things could be quite different from now. The environment could be very different. Yeah. So we can't like say this is what we're doing no matter what, mm -hmm. but that's the intention. Mm -hmm. And again, just kind of going back to our, our our thesis on those two companies, the the MCHI ETF does, it, it suits the role of us um, essentially re retaining exposure to this space. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, as I always find it kind of funny, you can just switch to a very similar yeah. stock, a very similar fund. Um, an ETF, a very, like literally a comparable ETF, but a different ETF, uh, it works. Yeah. So that's what we're doing in that case. Um, yeah. For those that are wondering, that is why we sold. Uh, take, for example, this is outside of the portfolio challenge, but in my personal TFSA, as I've mentioned, I didn't sell those stocks mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I, there is no benefit to doing that. You don't right. get that superficial loss mm -hmm. or you don't get that uh, tax loss benefits, I should say, sorry. In the TFSA. In the TFSA. Yeah. Not taxable account. But nevertheless, those were the two stocks that we sold um, on the next update. We very well may have bought them back, so, <laughs> knows, so yeah. keep an eye out for that. Yeah, but um, we did actually sell another stock, and I'll let you handle this. Sure. This was more or less in the uh, well simple portfolio. In the balance portfolio, I'll just cover this off uh, briefly here. Uh, we sold an ETF in the fixed income space called Q-Tip. So this is an in, uh, an inflation adjusted uh, security, so or inflation protected security. Mm -hmm. So um, for those of you who do follow the series, a number of months ago, uh, I can't remember exactly how many, but a number of months ago, we bought this with the expectation that inflation would tick up. up or yeah. increase, and it has certainly done that. And if we look at the dividend stream that we were paid, um, the the strategy for which we bought Q-Tip. Um, worked. It's kind mm -hmm. of served its purpose. Now, um, right now, uh, we, me particularly, I, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit less, I, I'm not sure that inflation is going to continue to rise at the pace that it has, um, you know, for a few different reasons. But, you know, one of the most common ones for, uh, certainly has caught the attention south of the border of the Fed and, you know, the, the, the administration. So I think they're going to be doing everything that they can in their power to start whacking that down and the tools are limited but the confidence that there are the i guess the confidence i had that that inflation was going to be is lesser now seeing, is, is certainly less now so took out that position uh, which leaves a gap in our fixed income that money to this point has just been sitting in in cash, the cash account yeah. and uh, our expectation our plans are to reinvest that in another fixed income entity i haven't made the final decision on what we're going to do with that yet it's so you know it hasn't been that long um, so that's the logic behind selling q-tip is because i think for us it served the purpose when we annualized the gain it was just so you know just high single digits so it, it you know served it did what it was supposed to do and now I'm just looking to how to reallocate uh, those funds. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the logic behind that. And then lastly, uh, just recently we added Johnson & Johnson. And back to mm -hmm. one of the earlier questions, we added shares of Johnson & Johnson in both the balanced and in both and in the growth portfolio. Yeah, so mm. a double up, as, mm. as he mm -hmm. said. And again, uh, I think Johnson & Johnson, we don't need to speak too long on, other mm. than the fact that this is a company that... It's one of those ones where, you know, it, it, at almost all times... It's hard to argue with a. Uh, it's hard to argue that this should not be a hold in a portfolio, either for a balanced investor, but even for us as a, in our growth portfolio, a very suitable stock to kind of complement some of the higher growth names. Yeah. And I was just looking at Johnson and Johnson for a, another purpose, and it's just like a tremendous, tremendous track record. 
in oh. terms of share performance, <laughs> in terms of dividends. Dividends. Yeah. I think the number last I looked was 59 consecutive years of dividend increases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just a, an absolute stellar, stellar business. More recent news on them is talk, the, the talks of splitting up the company yeah. and actually breaking that down. Yeah. That doesn't really change our, our outlook at all on the company in and of itself. Uh, the shares more or less why the shares were down a little bit as the markets have been choppy and that's more or less what drew us into this company mm. and saying, hey, this looks like a nice time to add. Very fairly valued in our opinion. Not a super deep discount by any means, but a fair add on a fair on a very high quality company. I, I think it is trading close to a support line if we do care for that yeah. all that yeah. often. But nevertheless, um, it's just it's just one of the high quality companies that we're happy to add. And it suits both of our portfolios. That was really, aside from MCHI, the major ad that we made in these mm -hmm. in these two accounts. And um, honestly, that's... Like you say, we haven't been buying it. a ton, despite yeah. the choppiness. Um, we're seeing some, we've seen some some big negatives, you know, particularly yeah. in the tech se sector. Uh, but we've seen a quick recovery. I don't just when we sat down to video this, the markets were up strongly again today, and mm -hmm. and we're going to continue to see that. Um, so we have, well, we'll look at the numbers here shortly. But we have you know, most of our money is invested in the equity markets at this yeah. point. And so we're comfortable with that. We have some cash, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a good time to get into sort of- The overviews? The overview, the construction of the portfolio. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, I don't know how long this video has been going for. Mm. I can't even see it on there. Oh, not not that long compared to our usual. You know, I just, the, as we were talking about that, you know, the lack of buys and whatnot, um, I got a lot of question, comments on my last video talking about timing the market. Yeah. Do you see all those? Oh yeah. yeah. A lot of them, a lot of them. And a lot of them were actually more uh, inquisitive and saying, hey, are, you know, are you contradicting yourself? I thought you you're not supposed to time yeah, the market. Yeah, some yeah, of them were just yeah. flat out like me. I was thinking about doing an entire video on this. So I don't know if it's something worth touching on in this um, episode. Well, but it's just like, I have a ton of thoughts on that because, yeah. you know, it, it, I think it's a misconception. It's one thing if literally we say, hey, we are selling out of all of our stocks and yeah. we are 100% cash and we're sitting on the sidelines. Because the markets for, are going to crash. Waiting for that bottom. <laughs> and yeah. that's like, I, I think the, the perception that a lot of people have yeah. because I just sold my TMSA and it looks like, you know, I, I have no no more money invested. Yeah. That is just one of my accounts. It doesn't yeah. factor in my RSP. <laughs> it doesn't factor in our, our corporate money. Yeah. We in this portfolio, just to kind of bring up the actual pick uh, the overall picture mm -hmm. we're still sitting at about I think we have combined uh, 78 percent 78 percent of our money invested yeah in the equity market in the equity market yeah. seven percent invested in fixed income again that number needs to be bumped up for all our allocations yeah but we have about 15 to 16 percent of our portfolio in cash and mm -hmm. it's with that money that we are being more selective and i, I say we because this is happening both on my personal side, yeah. like aside from you, yeah. as well as in these portfolios. And you know, the, the thought I had, like when I was just kind of thinking about what to talk about in that video that I wasn't gonna do, I'll just throw it in here. Because sure, you know, yeah. why, why not? We're only like, th like 30 or it's so. funny, minutes. we must think alike because I've prepared notes for a video specifically on the time in versus timing the market as well. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Well, hey, we can just combine notes here <laughs> yeah, because the you know, the, the reality is this, and, and I think it's kind of blunt and it's kind of, um, it may be against the traditional like, wisdom. But when you're investing in individual stocks, the way we're managing a portfolio, I think every decision does have a, a, a component, an of element, time, an of, element time. of, of timing does, the market. Yeah. Of course it you know, yeah. it's, it's one thing if you're saying I'm a strict ETF investor, I only do index funds and I don't ha have the care to, you know, try to generate alpha and buying certain stocks here and there. I don't want to play the cash. I just want to invest every single paycheck or every single week or every single month, the set amount. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, of, I truly do believe if you have a dollar cost averaging strategy, then just keep investing regardless go of the Bogle. market. <laughs> go with John, yeah, exactly. Just yeah. go with it, right? Yeah. Because you have no flexibility to do anything other than that, right? That's what you do when you're an index fund investor. Mm. But with our strategies where we both manage the account from uh, an individual stock perspective, there are a ton of benefits. There's a ton of stuff that you can unlock by doing this type of investment in terms of uh, maybe targeting some undervalued companies, in terms of maybe holding off on the purchases, right? If, if we're just an index fund investor, we're simply buying the index. You don't really have that flexibility. And, and I'll just point out, for a lot of people, that's totally nothing, appropriate. Nothing wrong yeah. with that. And yeah. and yeah, that's where maybe some of the, the comments we're coming from is like, well, maybe I'm an index fund investor. I'm not saying for, for you guys, wait to you know time your purchases, just keep going on a schedule. But for us, every time we decide you know, whether to add to this stock or whether to, you know, trim from this stock, there are so many elements of how that stock is doing, how the market is doing, which comes to our ultimate decision. It, it a, does. It's a calculated decision. It's a calculated yeah, decision, yeah, right? Yeah. I thought of the example, 
like Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway sitting on billions and billions and billions of dollars of cash. Yeah. That's market timing. It, it is. Like, you know, obviously it's not the traditional out of the market, in the market, like sidelines versus in, but there's a reason why he's holding so much cash. Sure. And, and, and yeah, this... Um, Just my opinion. I'm, I've always... I mean, I love, you know, it's time in the market, not timing the market. I mean, it, but that's so simplistic. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, if you had a choice of being an investor and being invested or not... Yeah, you want to put your money in, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is, 70, 75% of the time or more, the market's moving in an upward direction. And certainly over time, mm -hmm. um, you will come up further ahead than sitting on the side. I do not believe that there, you can't take a nuanced approach to that. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Brandon, if we said, you know, we think the markets are going to drop, we've gone to cash. Yeah, now you're timing the market. Mm -hmm. And we typically see that when the markets have dropped. And we certainly saw that in March of 2020. Everyone and I've seen it out. in many other yeah. previous periods before that when people literally will sell out. Or when the markets have been hot and everybody's all in. You know, those emotions drive that. Um, and so I, I think, well, I believe there is room for... We are investors, and like you say, almost 80% of these portfolios and our mm -hmm. personal money mm -hmm. is invested in the markets. Uh, but does that mean that you every you, know, you get a dollar and you need to invest it that day? Not at all. I think you mm -hmm. really can take advantage mm -hmm. of the volatility that the market offers us. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of the sort of the you know the world-renowned investors, you look at what those opportunities is how you make a difference in your portfolio. And mm -hmm. certainly, anybody who you know, made a, a bigger bet last March. You hear a lot of people say, I just bought in, you know, I went heavy in March. Well, that's timing the market because you in believe the market. In a good way, you know, yeah, yeah. Sure. Maybe not opposite of what a lot of people will time the market in a bad way and try and sell out during those times. But if you if you decide to double down, hey, I'm even going to get a loan and put some money in the market, that is timing there's the market a lot before of, the good. There's it, a lot it of really well. happy stories from, from March of yeah. last year. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like you say, it's on the opposite side of that, but you're taking advantage of the dips in the market and if you have some cash on the side, that's typically when you're going to want to go in. Mm -hmm. If you're 100% uh, invested at the time, then, well, you don't have money to put in mm -hmm. the market. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm I, glad we have similar thoughts on that, Dad. Because, yeah, we haven't talked oh, about that at all. But, yeah, it's... Yeah, we haven't done a specific video on it. But, no, uh, no and I get it. I, I get this. Oh, my God, you're, you know, yeah, your most recent yeah, video yeah. was... Uh, it's contradictory to what you hear. And, and yeah. again, I just, like, I wanted to just clarify that. Uh, from my standpoint, I don't want to like, and, and I may have made a mistake in the video by just the way I framed it and whatnot. Um, that may have been my mistake, though, like just the way I, I put that information out, I may not have been clear enough. Ooh. We are still very invested <laughs> in the market. It's just the money that, you know, we, I don't buy stocks every single week. I don't buy stocks every single month for that matter. Yeah, yeah. In our portfolios here, that's a great example. On the personal side, again, I, I don't invest on a weekly or monthly basis. So what I was trying to get across was, hey, just because the markets have been the way they are, given the environment that we're in, I'm just not buying stocks at this moment. It doesn't mean that I'm not 80% invested in my other yeah, accounts, yeah, yeah. as you can see here. Quick analogy, because you golf. Um, I used to golf a lot. I do once in a while. I try you, to golf. You, kind, you, you try to golf. You kind of, you know, the goal when you're hitting a drive is to hit the ball down the middle, yeah. right? And that's kind of the strategy. There are some times when you might try and cut the corner a little bit, you don't get too crazy with it because you can get into trouble, but you take nuance. Or if the wind is blowing, and it's more applicable to this, if the wind is blowing in one direction, you're not going to aim the ball down the middle mm -hmm. because it's likely going to end up on the wrong side of the fairway. You may adjust your swing and go into the wind and let it pull it back to the middle of the fairway. And right now there are a lot of winds blowing out there mm -hmm. um, in both directions. And so just say every single time I'm going to hit it down the fairway, um, yeah, it's just not, uh, play, play to the winds is what you're saying. Pl play, give it the wind, give it the course, play with what the course gives you. Right. So, I like that yeah. One. So I think sure. we kind of, I think we've kind of made a point there or, you know, yeah. share our thoughts and yeah. yeah. No, well, Hey, we'll probably leave that in for the viewers here, but we will wrap up so it doesn't go too long. Yeah. We will just finish with our overall portfolio and, update. And now I'd like to see the comments cause there's some very, mm -hmm. very, there has been some very, very strong conviction. You're wrong. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I mean, bring it on yeah. because uh, this discussion is, is good, right? For everybody. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, to finish things off, guys. Mm -hmm. So, uh, putting up the pro, uh, Wealth Simple portfolio here, we're sitting with 15 positions at a total of $28,085.44 to be exact. The Quest Trade portfolio, on the other hand, this one is sitting at $27,878.31. 
And um, yeah, what we'll do is actually just toggle over to our kind of like our compilation here. And this is where you can see from a top down level, what our portfolio looks like in terms of the holdings, in terms of the positions. I think one thing we've done a really good job of, to be honest, is, is uh, it, you know, from a top down level, this, this to me looks like a very nicely... Uh, I'm very, very happy with the names we hold here. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy with the diversity, especially from a top-down level, even though we are managing these two separately. Yeah. But if you're looking over onto the right side uh, chart or the right side hand of this page on the screen here, guys, um, yeah, our largest position is Alphabet, and that's been a case of it growing. Uh, the stock has actually done decently well since we purchased shares. Yeah. We have TD Bank and Royal Bank. Um, actually, Royal Bank's a bit lower here, but these bank these are our two biggest holdings in the wealth symbol portfolio, and. Um, yeah, it's it looks pretty good if you ask me. Well, and the goal over time, and we are seven months in now, is to is to build a well-rounded um, blend mm -hmm. between the growth and the balanced. And so, yeah, the overall look here, um, I think we're getting pretty close to where we'd like. Looks to be. good. The the sector allocation, I think, is right where we want to be. We got again cash at sixteen percent, financials at thirteen. Infotech or technology up at about 11.5. Industrial is another big sector for us. Healthcare at 10% with the recent additions. Uh, as well, I think we still own Pfizer, which has done uh, uh, Merck, sorry. We own Merck, yeah, which has gone and up. Pfizer. There we go, Merck and Pfizer, exactly. And then just the healthy weighting across the rest. Um, one thing that I think is worth notable, being, it is notable here, is that we do have the international... Um, Diversified. diversified, which is something that a lot of people would say, what, what is that? You yeah. know, what sector is that? If you did catch that, or if you can even see on that side of the page, um, that's of course the ETF that we have. That's essentially just kind of slotting in for a couple of our stocks temporarily, but it's yeah. essentially an, a, an internationally diversified ETF one, one holding. Yeah. And at the bottom here, you'll see, you know, we have nothing in our Canadian diversified mm -hmm. or U S diversified. And, you know, for this, for the spreadsheet that we built here, we just use the diversified for, uh, ETFs in, you know, generally speaking, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's a yeah. virtually impossible to go through and nail each one as to what sector. Cause some of them are very, like a, an S and P 500, like ETF, what are you going to do there? So yeah, yeah. So that's good. And then Overall, we've got um, about 79.3% equities in the Quest Trade portfolio versus 72.5% in the Wealth Simple. A little bit higher cash weighting in the in the Wealth Simple, which has that balanced mandate. So, yeah, it kind of makes sense taking shape, and um, yeah, we're just uh, enjoying putting it together. One of the things that um, I will I, I observed over the last little while, and I don't know about you, Brandon, we haven't talked about this, but because of so much else that's been going on. I've been certainly monitoring the portfolio less than I normally would. And I think that's kind of, uh, that's not atypical. I mean, we all have lives and yeah, we'd, you know, if, if we were portfolio managers, we'd be sitting here looking at this every day, uh, but we're not. And with Christmas coming up and with your wedding and all those things, um, I've, as I, you know, went to sort of summarize my thoughts, I went, oh yeah, it seems like I really need to summarize my thoughts because... Mm -hmm. I wasn't quite up to speed as to where everything should be. So we're, you know, everybody's human. Yeah. And uh, one of the nice things about building a portfolio that you have confidence in is that, yeah, I mean, if you go on vacation for a couple of weeks, you shouldn't have to worry that you're going to come back to a 60% you know, decline in your portfolio mm -hmm. if it has the diversity, that type of thing. So I just thought of that. I'd throw it in because Great point. I certainly was aware of that as I was, you know, preparing to have this chat um, that, oh, yeah, I... I I've been distracted with other things and yeah. you know, pull it back. Yeah. Life's been getting busy and it's not its not just the Christmas season too. Uh, for those that are sticking around, we were working on a big project, yeah. um, two big projects, two big projects. first yeah. and foremost. <laughs> um, I got my own thing going, you got your own thing going. Yeah. Within our academy, for those that are interested, by the way, always link down below. But uh, a huge thing just for the upcoming year, I'm doing a total revamp of our beginner training program. And literally mainly the only thing is I'm refilming the videos so that they're 4K footage. So they were HD, 1080p, you know, when I filmed them a couple years back. But basically it's being updated, it's being revised for, you know, modern day examples like <laughs> 2020, 2021 examples, factoring COVID as all these learning experiences and just getting that quality up to par. And I've been swamped and I'm only just finishing module three <laughs> of eight to go. So I have... Uh, a, a crazy amount of work here done on the back end. Maybe you can explain what you're working well, on sure. because th I know we've gotten so many <laughs> questions. For those of you that have uh, scheduled a call with us and either spoken with myself, Darwin, Allison, uh, Joe, 
so many people are asking for the retirement product. So yeah, and since you know, since I joined the channel, uh, the demographic has changed. It has yeah, um, and you know, Brandon so successfully created this channel for millennials to start the whole thing off. You know, nothing, uh, you know, from the ground up. Well, it's grown into a much more diverse demographic field. Bunch of old folks watching Bunch these videos. Bunch of old folks like now. me watching the videos. And so that's a good thing. And one of the most common requests is, okay, I'm going to be retiring in 10 years or in five years. Or even if you're younger and you're plan you, know, you want to have the best retirement possible, having a ton of inquiries in that regard. And like you say, on the phone calls, people are asking about yeah. that. So, um, so I'm creating, essentially from the ground up, uh, a, course, uh, a course geared to retirement, the things you need to know, mm -hmm. the how to plan, how to prepare yourself for it, and kind of leveraging the experience I had by working with so many people who went through that process. And it is, it's for a lot of people, it's not an easy process. It's not. Someone just DM'd me like literally yesterday asking about it, saying like, I should be feeling good because yeah. I'm here, yeah. but I don't. <laughs> yeah. I got my money feel here. And he's like, basically from the, the message he's saying, he's very, very unsettled as to yeah. How the next few years are going to play out for him? Yeah, very. And common. I told him that that's that's normal. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's don't feel bad. And so it, it was a project we had planned. Well, both of these we had planned for 2022, but just with everything else going on, we moved the timeline up on those. So yeah, that's taking up a ton of my time too, which I'm really enjoying. But developing the curriculum and and uh, putting it together, it's hard in a logical. Fo you know, fashion Flow, that people can yeah, follow, yeah. and then sitting down and doing the videos. So yeah, so that's it's, but it's been a lot of fun. But uh, but never, work, yeah. but nevertheless, we are going to be grinding away in the background on that, and I think we're going to make a commitment to posting more videos for you guys over the, the yeah. Christmas season. Yeah. So I know people got their stuff with family and whatnot. So we, we do too, but at the same time, we're going to start pumping out the YouTube videos, especially come New Year. It's going to be a, a video after video after video after video. That's going to be a really great time for us, and it's just going to be busy. I know on my end, um, like I said, got the wedding out the way, got the move out the way. I'm I, I'm ready to go. I don't know about you. Anything but. happening in the spring, or should I know about something? Oh, you have a baby coming in February. Oh yeah, that too. Yeah, that thing. <laughs> got to get the nursery all built up and what have oh, you. No, so no, no, I'll still be. Yeah. Lots going on. So yeah, so that's kind of a bit of behind the scenes, like you say. Yeah. 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 So. Good. Well, hey, thank you guys all for tuning into the video today. Um, if you guys enjoyed, I will uh, remind you, please do drop a thumbs up. That helps so much. I think they removed the dislike button for some people. They did. I so don't have the dislike, drop a dislike if you want. No, I, I don't. I, I still see them. I, I think they're phasing it out. Okay. Depends on the video. I see the button, but no number beside it. It does. Oh, yeah. I see them still. So oh, okay. that's weird. But so it, still, just like you, just don't know if you're part of the going with the flow or not. But exactly. Uh, well, if you guys didn't like the video, like it. If you didn't like it, then dislike it. It's up to you guys. But we would appreciate the likes. And particularly in this series, because we do focus at the beginning on trying to answer mm -hmm. questions yeah. that are relevant to you. If you have a question, throw it in there. We try and, and answer as many as we can without you know making a three-hour video. Um, if you see a question that you like, just give it a thumb or give it a comment, a thumbs up, I guess, to the question itself, yeah, yeah, the yeah. comment, because that's also a way we can gauge the questions that people Interest. are interested in. So yeah, so for sure. Don't forget to do that as well. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. We will sign off here. I'm gonna go back edit this one and hopefully get it up today for everybody. Cool. So that'd be awesome. Well, thank you, Dad. Dad, good to see you. Yeah. Great to be here. Nice. All right. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one.